Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Did the lover's relative help or not? Today's story has a similar plot. Enjoy watching it. They sat on the back of a pickup truck, illuminated by the soft light of the full moon, holding cold beers. The truck was parked on the highest peak of this flat, bushy county, with the lights of the small town where they grew up scattered across the valley before them. It was a beautiful, albeit sad, night, perfect for reminiscing. Do you remember that night? Like now, with the full moon overhead, when we sat here with six friends, playing guitars and singing songs that we made up as we went along? Will asked. Woody snorted. Damn it, of course I do. Woody Earl paid 20 bucks to get us two bottles of Mad Dog 2020, and by this time of night, we were almost all out. I wanted to die the next morning. I still hate wine, but we wrote some cool stuff back then. By the way, what happened to our classic that you guaranteed was a hit? I played in the drunk set, that's the third set at every show. If the audience is drunk enough, turned on, ready to party, this one always gets a standing ovation. Damn, there are fans who follow us and know all the words, and they sing it with me. It's not that I don't appreciate the royalties I get, but why didn't you record our hit? For some reason, Will, country record labels don't like the title, let alone the content. Come on! The stuff I hear on the loudspeakers of jacked up cars in any city makes me want to scream. I love you so damn much. Why can't we sound like a Sunday school song? It's just a love song with descriptive lyrics. There is no racism, no sexism, no misogyny in it. Okay, it's a little rough, but not like the rap I've heard where the word damn isn't even mentioned, let alone sung in the background of the entire song, like one of those I heard the other day. Dude, you've been living in the wilderness too long. Now it's called hip-hop. Well, then record it on a hip-hop label. I've written a box full of similar songs over the years while living with this stubborn bunch, but they're all the same, or worse. Hell, I've written a dozen in the last month. Find a label to record and distribute this, and we'll both make a fortune. I know you're pushing, Will, but honestly, brother, come to me. The label kicked you out, lied to you, so you can't even see the kids, and hooked up with your nemesis. How many more signs do you need to know your time here is up? Grab your pen and paper, your MacBook, your iPad, your phone, whatever things she left you, and start your old pickup truck. Let's hit Interstate 40. Hell, even the freaks in Nashville recognize your talent as a songwriter. We will get through this, I promise. Damn it, Woody, that's a tempting offer, but a big part of me wants to keep fighting those mills. The problem is that Donnie, the idiot, has stuck his uncle, the judge, so far down that I can't get going. Well, I think this is not the only problem. Her family believes in all this crap too, and you know how much influence they have. Will took a long sip of fresh beer and pondered the impossible. What the hell, Woody? How can anyone with eyes and brains think that I used physical force against my family? Has anyone ever seen one of them with sore spots? Have they ever gone to the doctor for anything I've ever done to them? Hell no, because it never happened. The problem is, how can I prove that this never happened when my wife lies like a dog, and my children, who don't even go to school yet, are not considered reliable witnesses? Oh, and the judge is her lover's uncle, and the social worker is her cousin. Will sat on the side of the pickup truck, holding a bottle of beer. He took a sip and asked the obvious question, I'm finished, right? Don found them on I-35, north of Waco. Woody Woodrow Wilson West and Will William Andrew Callahan had two 72 quart coolers in the back of their pickup truck, one filled with Lone Star beer, and the other with venison, wild boar, and deer sausages. The back seat contained all of Will's earthly possessions, and the space was only partially filled. Starting a new life meant starting with a clean slate, so Will left everything that reminded him of his wife. As he finished loading things up, a thought struck him. In his 28 years, he had never accumulated anything that was truly valuable to him. Maybe the next 28 years would be kinder. Woody, who usually slept until noon after a night of exploits, was on edge from coffee and apple donuts. He didn't stop talking for a minute. After the fourteenth time he told Will how much fun it would be to be on the road, writing songs and hanging out with a friend, Will finally asked him to focus on his immediate plans. How many more stops are left on your tour? 
Just three, buddy. And all within bus reach of Nashville, Woody replied. The last three shows of the contract, and then and then, they could go back to the studio. This calm will down. But don't think you'll just ride with us, buddy. You will play and sing next to me. I've already received approval for your participation. They won't pay you much, but you'll have food, housing, transportation, and as many fans as you can handle, if there are any you like among them. We don't play in the best places, you know, but there are always a few girls who want to meet a famous musician, even if they don't know his name, Woody added with a grin. Two weeks later, along with studio musicians provided by the label, they traveled by rented bus to the Coyote, a club in Charlotte, North Carolina, and then to a larger show at the Savannah Arena. They were also scheduled to perform outdoors in North Charleston at the Around the Bend Festival. None of the concerts were completely sold out, which Woody attributed to the poor reception of his second album. The album featured songs written by the label's favorite writers, songs that were technically correct, aimed at the young audience who bought the music, but they had none of what his fans expected. No soul, no heart. It was an empty shell, and Woody's fans preferred the raw, rough meat of the songs on his first album and those he played in dance halls and at the loud, hour-long concerts that Willie put on in Texas. But the label dressed him up, polished him, and sent him out to win the hearts of fans of the Florida Georgia Line style. They liked him about as much as they liked the music, and after his meteoric rise, his career began to decline. Fortunately, this tour was the last of his contract with the label, which became disillusioned with him as quickly as the new country fans. As they gathered for their final rehearsal before heading out to the Coyote, Woody handed out sheet music for a few new songs. We'll try these this weekend. The musicians, who you couldn't really call a band since they had only been together for a few days, shrugged their shoulders. They were paid no matter what they played. After rehearsal, Woody offered to buy everyone drinks at the Commodore Grill, but only drummer Gary and bassist Danny showed interest. Three pitchers of beer later, Woody and Will fell in love with a young singer-songwriter who played the keyboard. Her smile was contagious as she sang her fun, light songs, but what they loved most was her dark side. You guys know, as do I, that this is our last chance, Woody told Danny and Gary. This nonsense we play is not my music, and I'm going back to my roots. This most likely means I'm moving to Austin with Will as my bass player. Sorry, Danny, but he wrote most of the hits on the first album, and he's my best friend. Dude, I play seven instruments, if you count the harmonica and accordion, but I'm best with slide guitar, violin, and banjo. Every real country band needs all three of these instruments. Hell, I can even play the saxophone if you want some blues. So if you're asking if I'm interested, then hell yes, I am. If you're really going back to good music, not poppy country, I'm still free and available. But they say the girls in Austin are fine. Looks like you need a drummer, and I'm free and lonely too. The wife filed for divorce last month. She said I didn't meet all her needs and traded me in for a more expensive model, but this is even better for me. What she gave was not worth the cost. Will, with Gary on drums and Danny playing everything, said, we're just missing a keyboard player to sing backing vocals, duets, and sometimes take lead. Did you see anyone might join us? Yes, and she is now talking to the manager behind the scenes, came the answer from the next table. I bought her a dozen trying to get her to go on a date, but to no avail. Maybe you can do it. Will stopped at the bar, took a dark beer, and walked up to two women who were talking about something. He stopped at a sufficient distance so as not to interfere with the conversation, but the dark-haired singer noticed him and fell silent. The manager turned to Will and asked, Can I help you? No, ma'am. But perhaps this talented young lady can, Will said, turning to the singer. We're sitting over there, and we were very impressed with your song, singing, and playing. Any chance you could spare us a few minutes to talk about the new band we're about to start? I noticed you, and thank you for your support. Are you saying you're starting a band? She replied. I'm not sure I'll come over for Mr. West's style, but I'll come and listen. Is it okay if we continue our conversation later? Of course, Leela. Anytime. Looks like all this might not matter if you accept the offer we brought. They brought Miss Leela Livingston to the table, introduced her to the guys, and she asked, How did you know that I drink dark beer? The cowboy from the next table raised his hat, and Will gave him credit. 
Leela smiled and admitted, perhaps I misunderstood your intentions earlier. Sorry, and thank you for remembering. No, ma'am, you correctly understood my intentions. But I accept your apology. You are an amazing woman, and I would love to wake up to your angelic voice in my soul. If the band doesn't work out, I'll be here for the next songwriter round, we'll add it with a smile. Negotiations with Leela turned out to be a mere formality when Woody assured her that he was leaving pop country for good, and will ask how many more songs she had written in the style of exploring the human soul like the three she performed on stage. Woody and his band, with Will on bass, Gary on drums, Danny on various instruments, and Leela on keys, completed a mini-tour that freed Woody from his contractual obligations for the second album. This was just right because the public, to put it mildly, was cold toward most of the songs from the album and sometimes downright hostile. But the new things they were trying now, although raw and unfinished, told great stories, made them dance, or conversely, made them sit, laugh, or cry. Having completed his obligations, Woody received his final check, fired his manager, and said goodbye to the label. The label offered him an insulting new album contract, which he happily rejected, and they parted ways with no regrets on either side. Danny had a passenger van, Gary had a new SUV, and Woody had a cool white Silverado pickup. But Leela only had her clothes, personal belongings, keyboards, and a couple of other instruments, no car. Will was the first to offer her a position, and she willingly accepted. Their heavily laden small motorcade hit I-40 at 6 a.m., driving through Memphis to Jackson, then through Little Rock in Texarkana, and headed south from Dallas on a 35 e They stopped to rest, stretch, and also bought fruit and poppy seed colaches from the Slovox Investa. The colaches weren't a full meal, they were meant for dessert after dinner at the Height Miller Steakhouse in Waco, just down the road. They arrived in Austin at 7 p.m. and headed straight to the apartments Woody had rented online. The apartments were old but slightly updated inside. Their main attraction was their location, the intersection of South First and Bond Spring Road, just a few blocks from the running trails along Lady Bird Lake, a mile from Barton Springs and the green fields around it, and just minutes from Austin's renowned music scene. Woody had enough money to rent his own two-bedroom apartment, and Gary and Danny shared a two-bedroom, two-bath apartment, as did Leela and Will. Woody rented a rehearsal space a little further down South First, near the food trucks, and they left their instruments there after picking up the key from the mechanic at the garage next door. The room was safe and secure, having previously been used by a techno group that had disbanded a few months ago. The owner was glad that the new group had moved in and would bring him income. Property taxes in Austin were not low, Will thought, when he discovered that moving his things only took a few trips and took up very little space. Not many accomplishments for a man approaching 30. The apartments were unfurnished, so Woody purchased furniture from the best rental center. They weren't sure if they were renting with an option to buy, but they really hoped they weren't. Another plus was that there were no washing machines in the apartments, but there were two laundromats on site. Will thought he was back in college life, but no one else seemed to mind. Will had, as Woody put it, a treasure chest of songs he'd written over the years, celebrating life's big events and mourning its losses. They also described his beloved wife in the early years, through the joys of having children, and finally, as the selfish vixen she had become. The contents of the cardboard box of songs had been rapidly growing ever since she and her lover had attacked him and taken his children, home, and possessions. They would have taken his money too, but he had set up a trust for his children in advance. When he started making real money, he quickly transferred all his savings and investments into this trust, leaving only a few thousand for himself and making Robert his lawyer and confidant, his longtime friend. When Will decided to leave with Woody, he quit his job and simply disappeared, leaving power of attorney in Robert's name. Leela also had her treasures, although of a completely different kind. Her songs leaned toward folk and blues, while Will was a fan of country, western, southern rock, and outlaw music. His songs already had a folk element to them, especially from western and outlaw country, and he was fascinated by the possibilities that folk music offered, especially that coming from the Great Smoky Mountains, Leela's homeland. Their hard work paid off, turning words into songs that touched people or made them move. The more experienced members of the group took the lead in creating the music, and Leela and Will used each other as a mirror, checking and refining their lyrics. 
Most of the work on the lyrics took place in the apartment, while Woody, Danny, and Gary spent more time in the studio working on the music. After being on the road for about 10 weeks, Will picked up Gary's phone on a Friday to contact his lawyer. As expected, his wife added a clause to the divorce suit claiming that he had allegedly abandoned her and the children and now demanded literally everything, including the house and savings. At this point, Robert, Will's lawyer, had not responded to her demands for a full accounting of Will's financial status, but he needed to respond within two weeks. He already had all the information he needed, but he wanted to talk to Will before he acted. Of course you can give her all my financial data, Will said. It will clearly show that all my savings and investments went toward creating a trust fund for my children. Other than my 401k, all I have is an old pickup truck, a couple of guns, and that damn house she wanted so badly. The bank owns more of the house than I do, and she can take it. If I can save my 401k, otherwise we can sell it and split the profit. There's enough money in the trust funds to take care of the kids, but won't get a dime. She must present legitimate checks for the children, and you will pay them, not gym memberships for my four-year-old son, not skincare products or Victoria's Secret underwear for my six-year-old daughter, nothing like that. I'm also not going to pay the full cost of childcare so she can stay home and have a night with her lover. As long as she doesn't have a job, I won't pay for childcare. If she gets a job, I'll pay half of it. Understood? You know that her uncle, the judge, may rule against you, Robert warned. He can award alimony or oblige you to continue paying for the house and utilities at a minimum. Let them roll, Will snapped. She let a rich man, her lover, into the house. Let either of them sweep out and sell it, or pay for it themselves. That spent all my money that she ever got. He can make any decision he wants, but I'm away from Texas now, and his decision doesn't apply here. Tell her this, you can't squeeze blood out of a stone. The only income one have is a few hundred a month from royalties. I live on modest savings, and big income is not expected in the near future. Remind her that her accusations of child and wife abuse have made me toxic, and now no one even wants to talk to me about work. I'm nomadic, working as a day laborer just to have a roof over my head, and all this because of her and her deceitful lover. But if she drops her accusations, offers me generous visitation rights with the children, and agrees to the division of property that I proposed, I will sign the divorce papers without a second thought. And may these two live happily ever after. And finally, Robert, tell her from me, what goes around comes around, and let karma pay her a visit in six months. Robert reminded him to stay calm, stay out of Texas, or at least Bayar County, and asked how could be contacted if necessary. Will replied that he could be reached at a number that belonged to another worker, a nomad like himself. The number was from Kentucky, which he thought would confuse anyone trying to trace it. When Will returned and gave Gary the phone back, it was clear from the look on his face that things weren't going well. Gary asked if everything was okay, to which Will replied, no and yes. My wife tore my heart out and wiped her feet on it. Now she wants to strip me of my dignity. This is the no, but the yes is that I decided to take a break from creativity, put on my work boots and clothes, and tidy up along the creek that our terraces overlook, so that when I drink beer on the terrace, I'll have the beauty of nature in front of me, not garbage. Then, I'm going to get cleaned up, put on my dancing boots, and see what's so special about 6th Street. I'd rather do this with a group of friends, but if you guys want to stay creative, I'll go get drunk and dance alone. As they began cleaning up trash along the creek, neighbors approached and asked if they could join. Two of the neighbors had axes, so they were able to chop and stack large branches and clear the overgrowth along the creek that blocked the view of the quietly flowing waters. Of course, the creek probably belonged to the city of Austin, but no one was worried about getting fined for cleaning it up like that. When the job was finished, they had cleaned up the entire area along the creek that ran next to the houses, leaving a heap of trash that had to be picked up by the city. One of the neighbors said she would call and arrange for this. They decided to head to the picnic area by the pool for a cold drink to celebrate a job well done. People arrived with folding chairs and drinks of their choice, still in their work clothes, and began to get to know each other. As the sky began to darken, Will stood up and announced that he was going to take a shower, get dressed, and continue celebrating on 6th Street. He said he would be glad if someone would keep him company. 
about half of the 30 people involved in the cleanup thought it was a great idea and agreed to meet in an hour at Maggie Mirror. Will, putting on his good boots, sat down on the uncomfortable sofa and shouted to Leela, Come on, let's go. When she came out of her bathroom, he instantly reconsidered his opinion of her appearance. She was short, about 160 centimeters, and fragile, no more than 50 kilograms. She had very cute features and always looked pretty, if you liked long, straight hair and a fresh, natural look. But her usual clothes consisted of baggy, faded tops, loose trousers, and worn-out sneakers. She looked like what you'd want your little sister to look like if you had to protect her from predators, in other words, she was almost invisible. Today, however, her hair was braided into a long braid, her face wore makeup, blue eyeliner and lipstick, and she was dressed in a tight black and red v-neck pullover, skinny black jeans, and shiny black boots. Will stared at her for so long that she blushed and responded, slightly defensively, stop looking at me like that. Sorry, Leela, you took me by surprise, Will said. I didn't know there was such beauty hiding under those baggy clothes. If you'll be with me, I'll gladly become your companion today and protect you from any predator you want. Now wait a minute, I'll take a stick and a pistol, because with this view of you, you'll need a whole arsenal to fight back. Will joked. You're as complete a fool as the Christmas turkey, she replied, blushing. I know I'm not much to look at, but thanks for the compliment. Will, shocked by her reaction, quickly pulled her to the mirror in his room and said, Don't you see? Yes, this. Don't you see? Here is a real beauty standing in front of you. Don't try to tell me you don't look like a model or a movie star, like Audrey Hepburn, because my eyes say otherwise. Don't believe me? Wait until Woody and the boys see you. The reaction Leela received when they approached the van completely confirmed Will's words. Wide eyes, whistles, and cheers made her blush even more. Will could see how she felt, pleased, embarrassed, and slightly defensive at the same time. Damn it, Leela, why are you hiding such beauty under these terrible baggy clothes? You're a real beauty in sheep's clothing. We definitely need to get you out from behind the keys and put you front and center when we play live. Woody exclaimed. Leela, still embarrassed but clearly pleased, climbed into the back seat of the van behind Gary and settled into the second row next to him. Most of the residents in their apartment complex were younger than Gary and Danny, who were both 26. They were mostly University of Texas students, used to juggling study and partying, and that evening, they decided to join in the fun with their new friends. On the way to the bar, Will noticed that no one knew how old Leela was, and no one asked. She looked younger in her casual baggy clothes, but today, when she was dressed and made up, she looked like a sophisticated woman in her mid-twenties. Will decided to find out her age when the opportunity was right, although it didn't really matter to him. They parked a few blocks from the bar and were glad they had found a place at all. Woody took them to Maggie M., where he had played a couple of times when he was just starting out. The manager and owner instantly recognized him, hugged him, greeted him, and insisted that his group sit at the table next to the bar, which they kept for VIP guests. The first round was on the house, and when Woody announced that about 20 more people would be joining them soon, more space was cleared for them. When they approached to order, Will, who had always preferred beer, asked if they made real margaritas on ice or if it would be the standard weak version from the machine. The waiter was offended and assured Will that everything was done according to the rules. Will ordered a margarita on ice. Woody watched this exchange and exclaimed, Oh damn, watch your women, Will drinks tequila. Gary laughed. What's the story? Woody laughed in response. You can say so. Our taciturn friend becomes quite talkative and a little aggressive when he ingests enough agave juice. You'll have to keep an eye on him and keep a chair ready to stun him if anything happens. He prefers to use his fighting skills instead of negotiating in this state. Everyone laughed, trying to imagine the quiet, thoughtful will as the life of the party or a brawler. A total of 22 people from their apartment complex had joined them, and spirits were high as Will took turns drinking margaritas. He became more talkative, telling jokes, dancing with each woman in their group, and applauding the band. After the fourth drink, he got them to play a line dance song, then insisted that almost everyone in the place join in the dance. The real fun began on the dance floor. 
the band took a break and then returned to their favorite rock covers from the 1970s and 80s, and the dancing continued. Will woke up feeling groggy, nauseous, and with a headache that reacted sharply to any light or sound. When his vision cleared, he realized that he was in his bed. It was already light outside, and the aromas of perfume and frying bacon mixed in the air. He tried to get up, but his stomach wouldn't let him, so he lay down again, closing his eyes. Are you alive? asked a female voice a few minutes later. Barely, he muttered. Who are you? Don't you remember? The very love of your life, to whom you promised a lot of rare pleasures, if I would only agree to go home with you. She handed him a glass of water and three ibuprofen, waiting for an answer. Sorry, sometimes tequila does this to me. Well, did I fulfill my promise? He asked after swallowing the pills. Ha! Huh. The only reason you're alive is because Leela held you on one side, and I held you on the other to get you from the van to the apartment. You even tickled us a little when we started taking off your clothes. But as soon as we undressed you, you went to the bathroom and worshipped the porcelain god for about half an hour. Then you crawled to the bed, but you started snoring before you could teach us any of the tricks you promised us. Did Leela help you undress? Certainly. She was a real heroine, although she was also a little tipsy. Well, so was everyone else, because you simply insisted that we make a tequila, salt, and lime circle at the stroke of midnight. It was lucky that Danny refused, because he had to drive us all. Otherwise, we'd still be sleeping in the van on 4th Street. Sorry about all this, Will said. Unknown blonde, in fact, I am so sorry that I cannot express myself in words in my state close to death. What's your name? You really don't remember anything? I'm Lena Carolina NOV, another female musician trying to make it in Austin. You literally picked me up and carried me to your table to introduce me to your friends. Do you remember any of this? Faintly. Perhaps some fragments pop up in my poor, throbbing head, but you too? Go eat, Leela shouted from the kitchen. Will stood up, stretched, and noticed Lena's grin, realizing that he was still completely without anything. It's too late to worry, he thought. No, no shirt. Give Leela a little buzz, Lena teased. She looked at your without clothes body like that last night. And when I tried to get in with you, she became jealous and kicked me out to sleep in her room. I hear everything. Stop lying and get over here, or I'll throw away your eggs, bacon, and buns. Leela called from the kitchen. Lena giggled. Will, who had already come to his senses a little, asked, so... She wanted you to sleep with her. Are you lovers now? No, although she's cute, and I don't mind a little experimentation. But she has a huge crush on you, dumbass. Will was at a loss. He wanted to ask more questions, but then Leela appeared in the doorway, wearing a large t-shirt that barely covered her light blue panties, revealing what Will noticed were slender but very long and smooth legs for her small stature. He wondered why, after weeks of wearing old sweatpants, she had suddenly turned into an intimate kitten. You two sit down and eat right now. Leela demanded. I won't let Lena continue to lie about me. Wait, what? Are you twins? I swear, when you stand next to each other, you're like mirror images of each other but with different hair colors. Hell, even your names are Lena and Leela. You're the same height, you both have such beautiful legs, toned asses, and cute little breasts above tiny waists. You are definitely related. Lena pulled Leela by the hand, hugged her waist, and walked with her to the kitchen. Turning over her shoulder, she whispered loudly to Leela, he's looking at our asses. Shake yours for him. They both giggled and started swaying their hips, bursting out laughing when they saw Will hesitate and follow them like an obedient puppy. At breakfast, the girls looked at him the same way he looked at them. They forced him to wash dishes and continued to criticize his figure while he stood with his back to the sink. He threatened to throw a glass of cold water on them if they didn't stop, which made them laugh and caused them to run to the bedroom together. Lena stopped at the door and said sternly to him, Go get dressed. Woody is waiting for us in the studio in 20 minutes for rehearsal. Will had never seen this side of Leela. Instead of being quiet, withdrawn, and almost gloomy, she suddenly became cheerful, flirtatious and playful. Leela clearly had a strong influence on her, he thought. 
Then it dawned on him, Lena was joining the group for the rehearsal. This raised a lot of questions in his mind, but judging by what he had seen in the last few minutes, it promised to be quite an adventure. Woody could play several instruments besides guitar, such as keys and trumpet, but he was primarily a guitarist. Will, who wasn't even a professional musician, only played guitar, and Danny was the drummer. Lena played the violin like a virtuoso, then switched to fiddle and played like Charlie Daniels. After the short demo, she said that she was also good at playing banjo and slide guitar. The versatility of Gary, Leela, and Lena meant that the group could change its configuration in a variety of ways and could play almost any type of music. Woody, Gary, and the girls were delighted, and as the morning turned into day, they continued to explore their abilities, full of creative energy. Hunger soon overtook creativity, and around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they went to the food trucks for a late lunch. They sat at a table under the shade of an old oak tree and relaxed. Lena brought a folder with her and talked quietly with Leela, looking through it. They looked at Will twice with curiosity, and finally, Lena began. Will, do we have to get you drunk again to hear your story, or are you going to tell it sober? We're about to go buy a bottle of tequila and limes if necessary. No one can carry the amount of pain, anger, and anguish that we feel when we read your songs and not talk about it. But Leela says you didn't say a word when she was around. So, are you ready to talk, or do we have to go to the store to buy some booze? Woody looked at his friend and said, We've already done a lot today. Let me buy a beer on the way back to the apartments, and we'll meet on my balcony. I've got plenty of chairs there. I agree with Will, it's time you told your friends your sad story. Music from Woody's first album played quietly in the background. The breeze blew through the warm April day in Austin, and everyone's attention turned to Will. I don't have much to tell. If you put my songs in chronological order, you'll know the story of my adult life. Woody went off and became famous in Nashville with songs we wrote in high school. I married the prom queen and got a good job making crazy money working for her dad. We had wonderful children, who were pampered by their grandparents, and I completed my studies by taking night classes and studying online. I love my wife with all my heart, and she loved me too. That was the problem. Her mom and dad warned me, and I knew it deep down, but she insisted that she loved me so much that we simply had to get married. Hormones played a part, and we got married. She was an ideal wife for a couple of years and a wonderful mother to our kids, but when they were no longer babies, she wanted a nanny or daycare to look after them. She needed a new car every year or two, a new house because our old one wasn't nice or big enough. She needed new outfits, jewelry, and a bunch of shoes. She pushed me for a promotion so I could earn more so we could afford nicer things, but she hated that I was away from home a lot because of work. She hated my travel but insisted that I become a regional manager, even though her father and I both told her that I would have to travel even more. That's when she got grumpy and then cheated on me, eventually turning into the from hell. Her parents practically disinherited her when she got together with Brad Bogut and filed for divorce, accusing me of psychological abuse. When she got a court order banning me from seeing my children, saying I'd beaten them, her parents were horrified because they knew I was a loving father who would never harm a child. But when she stopped allowing both grandparents to see their grandchildren, her parents gave in and remained silent about her false accusations. Some of you may not be able to bear what I say next but my agreement with Woody is that we will record an album called Scum of Humanity. It will be about people like liars, narcissists, incorrigible cheaters, and the corrupt politicians and judges who allow them to exist with impunity. The main purpose of this album is to destroy my ex-wife, her lover, and everyone who helped them. The main goal, of course, is to earn a lot of money. So, we walk a fine line. We want the album to be commercially successful, and we don't want to get sued if it's perceived as evil or pathetic, both goals will be lost. Creativity is important, and with so many talented people on our team, we can take on this project. We are looking for a new and almost unique way to tell my story and destroy those who tried to destroy me. Yes, I understand that this sounds dramatic, but I have no other way to take revenge. Are we talking about the style of Willie Nelson or Michael Martin? with their departure from Nashville to Austin, or is it more in the style of rubber soul or pet sounds? Gary asked. The same, almost unique? I'm not afraid of anything because I have nothing to lose, Will replied. 
but we need to turn to our fearless leader, who is himself seeking rebirth, to make this decision. Woody thought for a few moments. Friends, I am enthusiastic about creativity, but ultimately, we need to make money, or this experiment will quickly end. My core fans are dedicated country fans who like the kind of music they want to represent themselves. The label's attempts to make me a pop country star were a complete failure. The teenagers didn't show up, and my fans booed me. Just ask the guys about the last three shows of the tour. The Billy Goathill pundits will eventually build an audience, but we need my fans from the beginning to add them. If you're not familiar with my first album, listen to it to get an idea of what they like. Haha, <laughs> and then you can listen to my second album to understand what no one likes, he added with a grin. Now, it was Will's turn to think. Asterisk Billy Goathill pundits asterisk, you say? I like it, although the others don't seem to know anything yet. When will we show them this? Will asked. I'm waiting for you. Woody replied, I don't want to lose my bass player to jail, and I'm not sure how you're doing with the law. My uncle said the ranch house is ready when we're ready. Are you ready? I was born ready, Will said. As far as I know, the kangaroo court is no longer interested in me, but I can check with Robert if you want. If he says everything is fine, when do we leave? Woody asked each member of the group, and they all shrugged and said, any time. So, he suggested, how about noon tomorrow? The trip will take three hours. By 11.30 a.m., the tools were loaded into the van, and they headed south. Gary and Danny were in the van, while the others were in a cool diesel-powered Ram Mega Cab driven by Will, with Woody sitting next to him. The girls occupied the spacious rear seats. Woody turned on his first album via Bluetooth, and everyone started talking about it. Then he turned on the second album, and there was a lot more discussion. The only stop was at the HEB store in Pleasanton to stock up on groceries, beer, and ice. Beer took up a third of the truck bed. They bought three coolers for food storage, the 75L container contained ice, the 50L container contained beef, pork, chicken, bacon, and milk, and the 38L wheeled container was filled with beer and ice. Surprised, Leela asked if they were going to stay for a month, to which Woody replied, We've bought enough food for three days, but we stocked up in case guests join us. The ranch house stood on the Frio River near Tilden, just a few miles from Choke Canyon Reservoir. The river was full thanks to the backwater from the lake, turning the place into a real oasis in the dry, dusty lands of South Texas. For the girls from Tennessee and North Carolina and the boys from Kentucky and Georgia, it was their first taste of the bush. Woody and Will knew there were only two options, either they would love this place or they would hate it. This was also true for the area's locals, many of whom moved to the cities after college and rarely returned. While the Highlands, Austin, San Antonio, and other urban areas of Texas grew too quickly for local residents, the population of South and West Texas gradually declined. Then, one retired petroleum engineer figured out how to extract shale oil. Now, there were more people and a lot more cars than the locals wanted, but they were happy to accept the business, and the landowners were happy to receive rent checks. Woody and Will watched their bandmates and were pleased that none of them had that look they so often saw, asterisk get me out of here as quickly as possible. Asterisk they looked at each other, smiled, and nodded. They toured the ranch on triple ATVs, inspecting cows, horses, deer, blue and brown quail, wild boar, caracaras, hawks, and wild pigs. The newcomers were delighted, and the refrigerator with beer and ice gradually became lighter. By the time they got back to the river and the house, everyone was cheerful and talkative, and Gary had to restock the refrigerator. Will made fajitas while the others chopped tomatoes, lettuce, and cut up avocados. Woody made fresh salsa with serrano peppers to the chagrin of the Texans. Southerners at first called these dishes rolls, but soon realized they were real fajita tacos when salsa and pico de gallo arrived. The amount of beer drank increased sharply as the heat of the peppers kicked in. Leela, Lena, Woody, and Will took out their guitars. Danny took a bucket, and Gary unfurled his harmonica. They played a couple of George Strait classics, including All My Exes Live in Texas, which sparked conversation about the old Frio River where they learned to swim. They learned that George Strait grew up in nearby Pearsall, and yes, that was the same Frio River. They also learned about its origins, 
Garner State Park, and the fact that it is possible to raft on the river and promise to do so soon. Each of the band members performed one of their songs, and no one was disappointed. By the time they had completed a few rounds, it was dark and everyone was in high spirits, so Woody sang his favorite farewell ballad, When the sun sets on Choke Canyon Lake, I'll be coming down to you. After this cheerful ending, everyone went to their rooms in the old big house. Woody took the master bedroom in the north wing. Gary and Danny occupied bedrooms in the same wing, which share a common bathroom. Will's room was in the south wing next to Leela and Lena's rooms, each with a double bed and a shared bathroom across the hall. Let me take a shower first, Will suggested. I'll be out in ten minutes, but you two will still spend at least an hour in the bathroom. Tell me, Leela, how long does it take you to wash your body and go to bed? Will teased. I only need five minutes for this, Lena replied. Leela looked at her flirtatiously and joked, maybe six or seven minutes to make sure everything is really clean, but no more. I think we should go first and slow. Will will go last since he needs ten whole minutes. I have an idea, Will suggested with a smile. Let's all take a shower together. We'll save both water and time. Lena tilted her head, winked, and replied, I think it will take much more than ten minutes, but I agree, if the other fifth place does too. Leela blushed and shook her head. I'm not ready for this yet, but thanks for the offer. So, you can look at me without anything, but I can't look at you? Will teased. Leela blushed even more, looked away, and ran into the bathroom, locking the door behind her. Lena and Will laughed. And you? Will asked, walking up to Lena and hugging her. She purred softly, laying her head on his chest. I would gladly agree to such a proposal, but I need sleep. And I'm afraid that Leela will cut my throat if we do this. Leela has no rights over me. We're just roommates and bandmates, but nothing more. We've never even kissed. I know, but she has a huge crush on you. She glares at any girl who approaches you. I'm pretty sure I won't make it until morning if we take a shower and do what I know we will do. Okay, then how about you just sleep with me? And I'll lock the door? Will suggested, kissing her neck. Lena sighed, as much as I would like to, I insist on putting it off until later. But know that if nothing happens between you and Leela, I will immediately take care of you as a bedfellow and see where it takes us. Leela opened the bathroom door and announced, Lena, the shower is ready. As Will finished his shower and climbed into bed, he heard muffled voices through the vent in the wall between the bedrooms. He listened but couldn't make out what was being said. So he choked, if I hear sounds from that room after you've been walking around all day in clothes that almost gave me a seizure, I'll come to you. He heard giggling, followed by sounds from both sides of the room. I don't believe it, the sounds should not be heard from two beds, he said. He heard more giggling and whispering, then someone climbed onto the bed closer to his room. The next morning, sitting on the porch with Gary, Danny, and Woody, Will watched as Lena and Leela appeared in the kitchen. He saw them pour themselves coffee and come out to them with innocent faces. Well, 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 Woody began, Lena and Leela decided to join us, and it's only half past nine. What did you do last night when you were so tired? We all heard how the house suddenly became quiet when you fell asleep, but are you really that tired from all these theatrical performances? Lena broke into a wide smile, and Leela looked at the floor and blushed. Will pulled her towards him. Sit on my lap, and I will protect you from evil Woody. She looked at him fearfully, but he insisted. She, still blushing, sat down on his lap and buried her face in his chest, refusing to look at anyone. This only increased the laughter and teasing from the others. She hid, but a faint smile appeared on her lips. Lena patted her on the head and giggled. Okay, stop teasing, Will warned with a grin. Sometimes girls just want to have fun, so let's leave them alone. It's time to have breakfast and get to work. I want to finish one song today. Breakfast was fun and relaxed. Leela finally got off Will's lap when he tried to spoon-feed her and sat down in a chair. By the end of the meal, it was clear that they were beginning to see a new, more animated, and cheerful Leela. This energy carried over into the work session. But when Will started performing the song he wanted to finish, the atmosphere immediately became more serious. It started like this. 
I will never lie to you, the liar swore. I will never cheat on you, the cheater swore. He doesn't love you the way I love you. I honestly promised, knowing that his love is just passion. The song became darker with each line, but these were exciting verses that told the story of a seducer without principles. Everyone present was completely immersed in it, and they worked through it until the song was ready for final judgment. It was only 2 o'clock in the afternoon when they finished, and Will suggested they look at another song from his notebook, Old Man. The next song should be a little easier. We need to intersperse something danceable among all this melancholy, Woody noted, to which the others readily nodded. Exactly, friends. This song is for our charming ladies. I think they can sell it. Maybe it'll even hit the charts. It's called I Want, Will Began. The song went something like, Baby, I want a new SUV with a big screen for me and the children. Baby, I want a bigger house with a garden and a gnome for me and the children. Baby, I want it. Baby, I want it. Baby, I want it. Baby, I want it. Next came the verses where the heroine of the song wanted a pool to sunbathe in while the children were at school and a hot bath in the gazebo. The girls, overjoyed, added new verses and turned the song into a pop country hit, somewhat reminiscent of Taylor Swift's songs. They fooled around, jumped around the stage, adding their own phrases. The song came out almost four minutes long. The girls energetically came up with more and more new verses, but Woody warned them that although the song could last at least ten minutes live, for the album, it would have to be cut down to four minutes or, better yet, three, so it would be played more often on the radio. By six o'clock, Woody said it was time to call it a day. He told everyone to take a shower, dress appropriately for stargazing and playing guitar, and be in the van in an hour. The guys loaded up folding chairs and waited for the girls and started whistling and noisily expressing their delight when they appeared with braided hair, white short shorts, tank tops, and sandals. Go crazy! Woody exclaimed, and Will began to applaud. Lena shook her hips confidently, and Leela tried to follow her example, but she looked more funny than confident. However, that didn't make her cute, slender body any less attractive. Before they crossed the county line, Woody asked Will, what did your lawyer say? Everything is fine? If not, we can do it differently. Will assured him that there were no warrants for his arrest, and they continued on until they reached a small Mexican food restaurant on the outskirts of town. A couple of beers, nachos, enchiladas, tacos, and a lot of chips and salsa later, they were back in the van, quietly driving through the small town of Cowtown, population 4,446, heading to Billy Goat Hill. Arranging their chairs in a semicircle facing the city with three guitars, a drum, a tambourine, and a harmonica, they listened as Woody began his speech. This is our hometown, mine and Will's. Nothing special, and we are no longer welcome there, but this is the place where we grew up. Over there, where the trees stretch like a snake, flows the river in which we learn to swim, just as George Strait learned to swim in the Frio. So we learned to swim in nose. Do you see where the road intersects with the trees? A river flows through this place, and there will have his strawberry wine moment. Lena, dear, sing us this song, Will said, sitting next to her, and they harmonized together. The song's lyrics retold Will's story. One restless summer, we found love, wild as the wind. On the banks of the river, along a well-trodden path. It's funny how memories like these stick around, like strawberry wine. The hot July moon saw everything, my first taste of love. So bittersweet, like strawberry wine. As soon as they finished, Woody began to reminisce about their childhood, when they were free to play all day and ride their bikes until dark, just to be back in time for dinner. He talked about how, in his youth, all the fields around them were planted with crops, and how they harvested watermelons, then other crops like black-eyed peas, onions, and finally corn. Once upon a time, there were fields of gold all around us, Woody said, starting to strum his guitar. Will joined in. This is the song we sang while sitting here, Will said. Our fields were not barley, but corn. But our experience was similar to what Sting described. Woody began to sing, and was soon joined by Lena and Leela, giving the song a sound similar to a duet between Sting and Eva Cassidy. You will remember me when the west wind walks through the barley fields. 
you will forget the sun and its envious sky. When we walk through fields of gold. Gary started with conviction. We need to add this to our show, if not to our album. Simply wonderful. What's the story behind you in this song? He asked Will. Will nodded at Woody to continue. It may be hard to believe, but Will and I were excellent students and sports stars. Well, Will was a sports star, and I was just on the team, but still. Even though we came from good families, were good students and athletes, and were generally loved by everyone, there was a family that felt we were unworthy of dating their precious daughters. And there was another guy from a rich family who hated us. Despite this, we still met with these daughters and made promises to them. We believed that our love was stronger than time, space, and social status, and that one day we would walk through fields of gold. Will ran away to Mexico and married his eldest daughter right out of high school, which caused quite a stir. Her parents, like the guy, were sure that she would marry him and unite their families. This, despite the fact that everyone knew he spent his entire college years sleeping with everyone he could while telling her from a distance how much he loved her and wanted to marry her. Will's reputation was restored when they gave birth to the most beautiful and gifted grandson in the world, and when the second, no less ideal, appeared, he became her parents' favorite. Interestingly, when she suddenly got a restraining order to keep him away from her and the children, allegedly because he was physically harming them, her parents supported Will. Honestly, it was outrageous. Nobody in the area believed it, except apparently the judge and the social worker, who were relatives of the same guy. Her family, who initially believed Will was unworthy of their daughter, took his side right up to the point where they, like Will's parents, were told they would never see their grandchildren again if they didn't support their daughter. Their parents gave in, and the situation became extremely difficult for Will. He tried to hold out, but sometimes you have to retreat and reconsider plans. So, about six weeks ago, we sat here with him, re-watching this whole farce, and came to the conclusion that he was incomplete. Took his things and drove to Tennessee. You know, sometimes the truth doesn't matter, and money trumps love. What the hell, Will? Are you going to just let them do this? Just take away your children and your good name? Leela asked indignantly. Listen, Will began defensively, I have a plan, but their privacy was shattered by the headlights as a huge pickup truck with raised suspension came up the hill and parked next to the van. A giant with long brown hair and a beard got out of the pickup truck and exclaimed, Damn it. He was right. Paco swore he saw a circle of chairs and heard guitar music as he drove by. Sierra, call them. Tell them to come here, he turned to the group. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tim, or Timbo for these idiots. We'll introduce ourselves properly later, but first, why the hell did you disappear? Just recently we were drinking beer, chatting, and planning a couple of murders, and then you just disappeared into the ground. What happened? Happened? Timbo, realizing that he would be jailed if he stayed, said, so Rob got power of attorney, and we immediately went to Tennessee. Paco pulled up in his monster truck, followed by another SUV with people getting out. The meeting lasted about 15 minutes, everyone got acquainted, and they discussed what had happened. They began to drink beer and whiskey at a faster pace, and another hour passed. Timbo became thoroughly drunk, as did Leela, Lena, Woody, Danny, Gary, and most of the other 22 people. The situation escalated when Timbo had drunk himself into a disorderly state. He blurted out loudly, So, what, Tennessee Will? Are you back there to help that sweet boy write new hits for the pop teen market? To hell with you and the horse you came on. Will answered, slightly slurring his tongue, They made me write that pop trash, but I left them to HR. Our lead writer over there says we'll be doing something unique, whatever that means, but definitely not pop. What the hell is unique? Paco asked, raising an eyebrow curiously. Instead of answering, Will began strumming his guitar and singing a song he had recently written. It was called Screwed, Blued, and Tattooed. It was a story about a wife who always wants more despite what she already has. She forces her husband to take a job that he and her father, his boss, both warn him will result in frequent absences from home. Then she starts complaining and cheating on him with his worst enemy because he's too little at home. When her husband finds her with her lover, he beats him after the lover begins to taunt him. The husband is arrested, sent to prison, files for divorce, 
and loses everything, including the children. After that, he disappears in Mexico. There was silence when Will finished singing. Paco then said, Damn it, now this is a song that'll make you shoot up the jukebox in the bar again. They remained on the hill for about an hour, playing and laughing, and the audience, consisting of local residents, either laughed until they cried or quietly sobbed with sadness, depending on what was being played. The music and songs continued to come in waves, and it seemed that the new group had already found its style. When they got back to the van, Woody, still drunk, muttered, it seems that the new creativity is a success, at least in its homeland. There's a lot of work ahead, but I think we're on the right track, said Lena, sitting in the back seat and falling asleep. While driving, the rest of the group rested for no more than ten minutes before they were all killed in the silence. Will drove the van back, lost in thought about Leela's words from earlier. Maybe I really gave up too easily. I don't care about the house or that, but what about my children? He thought. Stay the course. Play the long game, he advised himself. Asterisk you can lose every battle if you win the war. They slept until nine o'clock in the morning, drank every Alka-Seltzer they had, set beans to boil, and worked on music from ten to two o'clock in the afternoon. The guests from last night and a bunch of other friends will start arriving in an hour, Woody warned. They'll help with the cooking and preparation, but we need to light the fires, prepare everything for the salad, season the meat, and do everything else that needs to be done. So go wash, perfume, and dress like a human being. The 16 people from last night's party had swelled to 32 merry souls, and the newcomers quickly became part of the group, becoming old friends. As the evening wore on, as you might expect, someone wanted Woody to sing something from the old days when they sat in pickup trucks on Billy Goat Hill. He granted the request, as long as Will made sure everyone had a cold beer, but that someone in each vehicle remained sober so they could take the others home. After a couple of songs, accompanied by applause and cheers, Woody strummed his guitar a little and spoke in a normal voice. While I was singing to you, the author of these songs walked around, making sure that you all had a good time, as he always does, Mr. Responsible. Why don't you join me in showing people a different side of you? Will laughed, took the guitar, sat down, and said, let's sing the drunk's anthem from Billy Goat Hill. Woody started playing with a grin, and they sang together. I love you so much I could. Everyone burst into laughter and applause, and Will suddenly commanded, twins, rise up and sing an ode to my ex-wife. Lena and Leela stood up with a giggle, walked into the circle, and stood with their hands on their hips. Each of the musicians took an instrument to play. The girls swayed their hips, sang in privileged voices, begged, and batted their eyelashes at any man they addressed. Lena even sat on Timbo's lap for a few seconds before laughing and running back into the circle, causing an outburst of laughter from the audience and a show of displeasure from Sierra. The guys continued to play because the girls kept coming up with new verses about different things, like underwear from Victoria's Secret, new rain boots, more expensive floor mats for a new car, and even a bottle of expensive cognac for a friend. It was insanely funny, and when Woody decided to end the song with the line, Damn it, woman, you can't get everything you want, Lena flirtatiously sat on his lap and kissed his cheek. Will's wife's ex-best friend pursed her lips and said calmly, She will die when she hears this song. Her parents, brothers, and sisters, and all her ex-girlfriends, like me, will immediately understand that this is about her. When will it be possible to buy a copy? I want to play it on repeat on the parade flow we're going to put together for the fair. We'll all dress up like, you know, who? We'll pose and walk just like Lena and Leela. This will be epic. When they returned to Austin, the fun gave way to hard work. They worked on songs for six hours every day but didn't forget to stay physically fit. They ran, lifted weights, swam at Barton Springs and Deep Eddy, and kayaked at Lady Bird Lake. They each took turns making breakfast, usually went to taco trucks for lunch if they weren't doing something creative, and for dinner, they either cooked themselves or went to one of Austin's popular restaurants. Austin is a city with a rich culture, and the guys quickly immersed themselves in its atmosphere. Places like Hula Hut and Abel's on the Lake, with their views of Lake Austin, became their favorite spots. But they also had a hard time resisting historic places like the El Rancho, El Patio, Skull's Garden, Cisco's Hills, or Hofbrau, not to mention Dirty Martin's Burger Joint and Ice Cream at Sands, 
which was right next door to their apartments at the Broken Spoke. At one of Austin's most famous music venues, they met the man who would become their manager, Barry Donaldson. A 26-year-old who was a big fan of Woody's first album, he had already managed three successful local bands. He won their trust, saying that the label had gone crazy when they released Woody's second album. They invited him to listen to rough cuts of Woody's third album, and after that, Barry begged them to let him become their manager. Guys, this album can become a real bomb. I have no idea where you found these writers and musicians, but I've never worked with a band that had a better chance of success. Please, give me a chance to be a part of this. My team is one of the best in the music industry at promoting across technology, social media, and digital platforms, but we also work well with radio, television, and live concert organizers to give our clients maximum exposure. So far, only one of our clients has gone national, but I'm absolutely sure that you are the next group. This will be a new challenge for us. After his vow to give advice but not interfere with their creative freedom, they sign a contract. So, the Billy Goathill pundits found a manager, a man who really liked their music. Now, Barry took over the business side of things, which had always been a headache for Woody, and they were able to focus entirely on the music. From time to time, Woody, Gary, and Danny entertained girls in their apartments, but Will did not, and the girls remained faithful to their abstinence, at least when it came to men. After a particularly busy week with their first album almost ready to be recorded, they decided to have an evening of relaxation and celebrate their successes. They started at the eclectic clubs on 4th Street, then crossed Congress Avenue to East 6th Street, famous for its nightlife. Since they were going to take an Uber, no one held back, and by midnight, Will was once again demonstrating his famous tequila behavior. He made a few hundred new friends, danced dirty with a few dozen college girls, and they decided it was time to leave before some of the guys wanted to deal with him. On the way home, Will started making loud proposals to Lena and Leela, but they just laughed and reminded him that the last time he promised something, he passed out and missed all the fun. The girls had no idea that Will was happy and slightly drunk, but not to the point of losing control like before. He just wanted to know if they would go for it. It seemed that they wouldn't, but still, he sat between them, and no one objected. As they approached their apartments, Lena started to get nervous, and Leela looked a little distracted. Will demanded a kiss from each of them before they entered the apartment. Although they both looked ready to continue, he sent them to their bedroom, washed himself, and lay down on the bed without clothes. He could hear them giggling behind the thin wall. Will gave them a few more minutes, then quietly crept across the living room to their door, which was ajar. He joined them. After that night, the girls no longer played together. Leela moved into Will's bedroom. An unexpected side effect of nights in Will's bed was that the reserved and shy personality that had characterized Leela since they found her in Nashville disappeared, along with her shapeless clothes. A vivacious, outgoing, and funny personality emerged. She began to dress in dances at the keyboard or on stage. Freed from their mental shackles, they discovered that her vocal range was much wider than she had previously shown and that she could move and dance quite seductively. Leela's transformation inspired Lena to become even more outgoing and cheerful. She developed some very cute dances that she performed while playing the violin. After a particularly rowdy rehearsal in which the girls tried to outdo each other, Woody called a group meeting for 6 p.m. on his terrace. I'll order everyone tacos from the truck, bring your own drinks. We need to discuss some serious issues that may affect our future. No one knew what to expect because a different Woody appeared before them, a man with a mission. Even Will was puzzled. To add to the confusion, Woody started by saying, Yeah, I know we're almost done with the album, but we need to start over. Someone's been holding something inside, and it changed everything. I'm supposedly the star of this group, and this was supposed to be my third album, but I propose we make this the first album of a new supergroup known as the Billy Goathill Pundits. No, listen to me. I'll still be up front and be the lead vocalist on some songs but Will's angsty voice and mannerisms will convey the other songs better than I will. He captures the dark and moody much better than I do. But the most important thing is that we now have a highly developed version of the twins. I don't know if we have some kind of magical organ or something, but Leela, damn it, girl, how did you manage to keep it all to yourself? It turns out you're prettier and prettier than Martina McBride, and you have an even greater vocal range, 
which is a rare combination. Lena has always been open and cheerful on stage, but your excitement makes her sing harmonies like your two members of the Celtic women and move like Michael Jackson's sister. Leela's eyes were wide, and she looked scared. Lena smiled in anticipation. You, Leela, will sing the song you wrote about your mother's boyfriend. Lena, you will sing your song about going through puberty. And Danny will decide who will sing his song about falling down the stairs. So I'm moving from lead singer to music producer for this group. We'll be revisiting some of the songs on our album to rearrange them to suit the incredible talents of these rising stars, and our dark and moody old friend. He's not as talented, but he can be damn convincing, like Muddy Waters or Johnny Cash. Questions? Leela had many questions, Lena had several. The experienced musicians simply smiled, they knew Woody was right. Will grumbled, it's a shame she didn't come out of her shell sooner. I want to get this thing on the air as soon as possible. Lena reminded him that she had told him to take care of her a few weeks ago, but he had refused. Leela smiled at him challengingly, winked, and silently said, Magic organ. They stayed up late that night, rewriting and ranking the songs, but were in the studio from early morning until late at night throughout the next day and the rest of the week. They continued to work well into the next month. Summer had ended, and autumn had begun, just like it is in Austin, Texas. The most noticeable change was the temperatures, which were in the 90s instead of the triple digits, and the influx of hundreds of thousands of fans of the Longhorn football team from Friday through Sunday. As the city quieted down again, Barry spoke to the manager of Maggie Mays, who quickly replaced the local band with the pundits on Thursday night. It's not usually a popular night, but the building's residents spread the word. Barry mentioned his new band on radio station KETT, and social media did the rest. In Austin, everyone wants to be a part of something new and hip. When they took the stage, the hall was almost completely filled. Woody introduced each member of the band and spoke briefly about each one, then told the audience that if any of them were fans of his second album, it would be better to leave now, because it doesn't sound like that at all. No one left, but a few people applauded. The rest had no idea who he was or what he was talking about. We are the Billy Goathill Pundits, and these songs are taken from our new album, The Human Condition. Every member of the band contributed to the writing or arrangement of every song, but I have to point out that Will here is the man behind this album. He wrote most of the songs, and it was his ideas that led us to create an album about the human condition. Like the human condition itself, some songs are light and joyful, some are dark, and some are full of anger and harshness. Stay with us, please, and then we will give you the opportunity to criticize our songs and our music after you hear them. We'll join Woody on the first song, Boss Rule. It told the story of a small, isolated town and county where a few wealthy families controlled the banks, good jobs, the city council, courts, judges, and law enforcement. The song had a folk Americana flavor and featured several banjo duels between Lena and Gary that were reminiscent of a scene from the movie Deliverance. The spectators sat motionless, watched, and listened. This was not music for dancing or singing along, it was a bitter story told in song. When it ended, they sat quietly for a moment longer, and then the applause and shouts of approval began. People came in from the street after hearing the noise, and soon the bar was filled to capacity. Like a cool breeze on a hot night, Leela's song Holier Than Thou, or Nose Valley of the Hypocrites, had people laughing, clapping, and singing along on the chorus. Instead of condemning mommy's short skirts, the song featured evangelical church members condemning the youth, the poor, and Hispanics, while turning a blind eye to the fraud, lies, and theft within their ranks, making their hypocrisy even worse than in Harper Valley. The song Cheating, sung by Will as the cheated husband and Lena as the cheated wife, talked about the signs they missed when their spouses cheated. Lena invited everyone who had ever been betrayed to join them and sing along in a chorus full of anger. Some spectators had tears on their cheeks. Leela's song, with an upbeat style reminiscent of The Lion Sleeps Tonight, was also somewhat confusing until the audience realized it was about corrupt cops and their powerful patrons. The lukewarm, bewildered reactions to the first verse gave way to rapturous applause once the meaning was grasped. The duet of Lena and Leela, Dad, We Miss You, drew the loudest applause of the evening. Will took the microphone and performed the Hank Williams classic Your Cheatin' Heart, with Lena and Leela energetically singing along on backing vocals. 
Lena and Woody performed a rousing version of Johnny Cash and June Carter's Ring of Fire, which had people singing along and dancing at the tables. The girls took the vibe to new heights with a catchy, flirtatious version of I Want Will. Scion Scales of Justice and Happy Now That You Got What You Wanted were the next songs. In the first, judges and social workers are shown in a bad light, while the woman's selfishness and greed are exposed in the second. After each song, the audience shook their heads, cursed, and frowned. I Got Everything, including The Kitchen Sink, performed by Leela and Lena, was a cheerful account of the victories of a cheating wife in kangaroo court. It caused both laughter and outrage. Woody performed Will's latest song, a satirical number called God Asks My Permission, in which the lead character is so rich and powerful that he claims even God asks his opinion. The meaning of No brought together all four vocalists to tell the story of a con man trying to seduce his wife and her failed attempts to keep her no. Will ended the show with I'll Never Lie to You, which featured the same seducer making promises he never intended to keep. Woody thanked everyone for their attention and asked for feedback. There were plenty of opinions. Most reviews were positive, but one of the most common comments was that the order of the songs created emotional swings that were too difficult to process. Woody promised to take this opinion seriously and thanked everyone again. The audience demanded more, and they had even more songs, but they weren't sure how long they could stay on stage. The venue manager told them they could play all night, but they needed to take a break to sell more drinks. They interacted with fans, had two cocktails, and then returned to the stage to perform several songs that were not yet fully completed but were already well received. Next came six of Woody's best songs from his first album, after which they performed a variety of covers, ranging from Appalachian folk songs and bluegrass to southern rock and country. The audience sang and danced along with them, commenting on their versatility. A photographer and videographer were on site from the start of the show, and with them was a woman who insisted on interviewing the band after the show ended. She didn't introduce herself properly but said she was good friends with Barry, their manager, who was very excited that he now knew why there was little chance the report would be devastating. So the musicians opened up to her but stuck to the official story about the inspiration for their songs, rather than personal experiences. They said their creativity came from researching real stories. The woman knew this wasn't the case, but she also knew they didn't want to openly declare personal experiences in order to avoid becoming the target of lawsuits from those who might recognize themselves in the songs. So, she allowed them to avoid the topic, at least that night. An entertainment feature she sold to a local ABC affiliate hinted that the band members' personal experiences may have played a role in the writing of most of the songs. The next morning, they went back into the studio to perfect some things that didn't sound confident enough for a club setting. Two days later, they began recording tracks. The album was developed over several months, but its recording took only a matter of days. They wanted it to sound more raw than polished, but still polished, and the renowned producer Barry hired was more than pleased. The band members were equally pleased. Meanwhile, new fans who were moved by their debut at Maggie Me posted clips of the performance on YouTube. A few days later, part of the report, which aired on KVW in Austin, ended up in an entertainment segment on Good Morning America that highlighted unconventional music groups, calling them the creators of conceptual music. The YouTube video received a significant amount of feedback, mostly positive about the music and lyrics, but some people complained that they didn't listen to music to make them feel depressed or angry. Will smiled, their songs were indeed intended to be provocative. The Good Morning America segment generated much more controversy as it featured segments where Leela and Lena sang about abuse, Will criticized the corrupt court system and local government, and Woody explored the delusions of grandeur among the rich in his lyrics. As the report ended, the song Leo played was praised by the host for how it conveyed the growing distrust of law enforcement in poor and minority neighborhoods. Overall, they couldn't have created a better promotional campaign for the human condition. The first single from the album began airing within a week. As was the case across the country, in the band's hometown in Brush Country, people watched Good Morning America, and young adults and teenagers with YouTube accounts shared their thoughts. More young people were on Instagram, while adults preferred Facebook, and fragments of their performance, professionally filmed by a videographer, became available to their followers and friends. Woody received dozens of messages and calls over the course of several weeks from hometown contacts. No one knew Will's new number, but many knew who the main characters in his songs were and shared their emotional responses with Woody. 
they also began expressing their disgust to the people who were the subjects of the songs, which caused great discontent among the upper echelons of society, accustomed to worship or, at the very least, passive respect. Their first show after releasing their first singles was at Maggie Mies, and this time, fans had to show up two hours before the show started to have a chance of getting a seat. They played for two hours to a packed crowd, with only two 15-minute breaks, and God knows how many social media posts were made during and after the show. They woke up to find that they had become a trend, and their social media accounts, which they didn't even know existed, were inundated with friend requests and followers. Someone on their team answered most of the requests and posted new photos and videos of the group members, whether alone, as a couple, in a small group, or as a team. This would have been a surprise to them if they had known about it. Their number of followers and friends grew rapidly while they continued to rehearse songs for their second album or polish their show for performances at various sized venues. Barry's technical team was great, but now it was time to perform live shows around the city to hone the show while Barry prepared for their first tour. They needed new equipment for some of the larger venues they were likely to play, but that required money. So, they were willing to do anything that would bring in money and improve the show in hopes of an upcoming tour. The next show Barry arranged for the band was at the historic Scoot in on East 4th Street. It was an open space with a much larger capacity than Maggie Mies, but not too big. They arrived early, and a security guard made sure the stage remained clear until they were ready to perform. It was a Friday, and the Longhorns had a home game the next day, so the town was packed, and so was the Scoot Inn. The evening was the first cool one of the fall, with a slight breeze, but the DJ warmed up the crowd well, and the two bars ensured they were sufficiently intoxicated by the time the band took the stage at 8.30. The stage was only two feet tall and intimate, with people crowded right in front of it. Woody stepped up to the microphone, introduced each member of the band, and told the story of the band's creation, starting with the night they gathered on the back of a pickup truck under a full moon when Will realized his marriage was over and he had nothing left to lose. The crowd applauded and laughed as Woody described how Lena was kidnapped by Will while under the influence of tequila and loudly cheered for Leela after hearing about her amazing transformation, her vocal abilities, and her harmonious combination with Lena. Will, Woody, Danny, and Gary were scheduled to perform their solos during the show, but Woody gave them the opportunity to lead a jam session with the rest of the musicians as a warm-up. The session lasted over five minutes and included blues riffs, jazz improvisations, classical tunes, and bluegrass elements, with the girls and Gary switching between instruments as needed. This was very warmly received by the audience. Woody then returned to the microphone and warned the crowd, the songs in the first part of our show are taken straight from our new album, The Human Condition. We wanted to call it Scum of Humanity, which might be more accurate, but our manager said it would turn off buyers. Before we start, a warning, the first part of the show will be a little intense. Please listen not only to the music but also to the lyrics, which may resonate with some of you, maybe most of you, in one or more of the songs. Before you all run away after the first part, know that the songs in the second and third parts are much lighter in mood, and you'll hear some compositions written by members of our group. Each of them contributed to this album, and many of these songs will be considered for inclusion on the next album, and perhaps beyond. Remember, the first part of the show is about real people. Be as angry as you want at those who committed these acts, but do not hate the messengers. Woody and Will started the show with Rule of the Rich. They were joined by Leela and Lena for a rendition of Leo and then Will Scion Scales of Justice. The Austin crowd was excited after the first song and angry after the third. The song Holier Than Thou, performed by the girls, lifted the mood of the audience, but then cheaters and women of easy virtue again caused sadness. Following that, the emotional dad, We Miss You, Your Cheating Heart, and Ring of Fire gave the crowd a chance to catch their breath and sing along with the band, which they did with joy. The satire of I'll Never Lie to You was not lost on the audience, and the scene of seducing a loving wife and the meaning of no was also received very warmly. The mood lifted again with I Want To and I Got Everything, only for Leela and Lena to turn it back into darker tones with the rest of the songs. When they finished singing Happy Now, everyone in the room was ready to take a break and have a few alcoholic drinks. Lively discussions began in the audience, which continued with the band members as they walked off the stage. Most of the conversations with the musicians were full of congratulations, 
but many spectators talked about how they themselves had experienced something similar to what was discussed in the songs. The second part of the show was very different, debuting new stories and songs that were being considered for a second album. These songs had more romance and less tragedy. The music was more rhythmic, using a variety of instruments orchestrated by Gary and Lena. The third part included a variety of covers, from George Strait and Garth Brooks to Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, and Waylon Jennings, and from Leonard Skinner and the Allman Brothers to the Eagles and the Rolling Stones. The entire crowd was dancing, screaming, and enjoying the show, demanding more and more encores. Before the pundits could leave, Lena and Will performed Strawberry Wine for the first encore. For the second, Woody, Lena, and Leela sang Fields of Gold, and for the final number, all four performed When the Sun's Going Down Over Choke Canyon Lake, I'll Be Going Down On You. The audience liked this performance so much that they wanted to hear another song, but this was really the last. The band members stayed and interacted with the audience. The next day, they learned that thousands of videos of their performance had been posted online. These posts were evenly distributed across the three parts of the show, but songs from the album received more comments and were shared more frequently. The hashtag hashtag BG Pundits became a digital sensation without the band members even knowing it. Barry informed them that the following evening they would have to spend an hour live on their website to interact with fans. To which they replied, what website? They had to leave rehearsal early to clean up and change into more appropriate clothes than what they wore in the rehearsal room. Nobody wanted to do this, expecting stupid or repetitive questions, as is often the case in interviews, but it turned out that their fans were smart and well-versed in their music, so communication became a pleasure. Will, Leela, and Lena could not openly admit that personal experiences formed the basis of their songs, but they did not categorically deny it either. It was like walking on a tightrope, but Will confidently led the way, and the girls followed him. Woody simply stated that he hadn't had any troubles, and that was the end of the matter. The questions for Gary and Danny were about the music, not the lyrics, so they got the most out of the conversation. They stayed on air for over 90 minutes before excusing themselves and leaving for dinner, with social media full of positive comments about their interaction with fans. Barry arranged for them to have a concert and dance on Saturday at Mavericks in Buha after the planned group broke up two weeks before the show. Mavericks is a two-story establishment, large and loud, filled with cowboys and cowgirls of both sexes. The band members were unsure how the songs from their concept album would be received, but it turned out that cowboys and cowgirls faced the same problems as University of Texas students, yuppies, and liberals from Austin, or faced them in their childhood and adolescence, perhaps even more than anyone else. They hated those who abused privilege, corruption in government and the judiciary, traitors and liars, and those who lied and deceived, taking everything from the innocent. It was Lena's idea to collect donations for charities, so after the first set ended, she took it upon herself to highlight each of them and talk about each organization's mission. She received heartfelt hugs from charity representatives after the show. The bartender sent a tray of beer onto the stage immediately after the end of the first part, and the band members dispersed around the hall to chat with fans. Will had barely taken a few steps into the crowd before he was grabbed from behind, lifted into a bear hug, and lifted off the ground. Guess who, a loud voice sounded, and Will muttered with a laugh, Let me go, Timbo, you beast. He found himself on the ground but was immediately attacked from the front by large breasts and the scent of perfume from a dark-haired girl named Sierra. They laughed and talked for several minutes. He found out that a lot of people from his hometown were coming to the show and agreed to meet them after the final set if anyone stayed sober. Damn, you guys always made me drink, Sierra said over the noise, but it used to be because we were having so much fun. Now I want to drink because this story is so sad. I want to kill your ex and the scumbag she got involved with to save your children. These songs aren't necessarily about my kids, Will answered carefully. Lena and Leela wrote two of them based on their own experiences, and Danny wrote one with me, but I have reason to believe that there are indeed serious problems with my children, more to do with neglect and lack of love. I know that my daughter is becoming more withdrawn and sick every day, and someone needs to take care of it. I can't because of court orders, but I'm already thinking about hiring a private detective. Give us a week, and we'll try to figure something out, Sierra promised. If we can't, then hire someone. They can't harm these children with impunity after everything they've already done. 
the second set was received extremely warmly. They completed some songs and refined others, and the light, rhythmic music had people laughing, dancing, and trying to sing along. There were a few concept songs, but the biggest hits were High Flyers, a song about self-indulgent parents who neglect their children while traveling on private jets, and Screwed, Blued, and Tattooed, which Woody called Will's story. The third set, consisting of covers, ended with the song Strawberry Wine, Fields of Gold, when the sun goes down over Choke Canyon Lake, and for the first time in the finale, they performed the song I Love You So Much I Could. A meeting with hometown friends was delayed due to numerous encore performances but still took place an hour after the show at a small guest house near Driftwood. About six hours later, Woody texted Barry demanding that the band perform at a local fair and pork cooking competition being held the second weekend in April in their hometown. Around three o'clock in the morning, Barry spoke on the phone with the woman in charge of organizing dances at the fair, none other than Sierra, and they agreed on a fair price for the group's performance, zero, but promised a lot of beer and barbecue. After nursing their hangovers and stretching their muscles from sleeping on the couches and rugs, the group headed to their lunch reservation at Salt Lick for 2.30 p.m. They ate, hugged, kissed, and parted as old friends do, with promises and assurances, and then the group returned to work. They received so much airplay and commentary on their first album that they began to worry their songs might lose their deep impact on audiences. Woody decided he wanted to release a second album just before Christmas, so they redoubled their efforts in rehearsals and in the studio. At the same time, Barry wanted them to perform at various venues, and their lives became an endless cycle of rehearsing, polishing material, and traveling to performances throughout Texas. They received a warm welcome in Fort Worth, but not so much in Dallas. Shows in the Houston area were completely sold out, and tickets for two shows near San Antonio sold out within minutes of going on sale. It was fun, exciting, demanding, and stressful at the same time. Will and A.A. dealt with stress with each other, while Lena, with the help of their toys, and the other three men chose their partners from among the many applicants. None of them understood why Lena refused to choose among the many suitors, but she seemed happy, so they did not interfere. Meanwhile, the money kept coming in. After Sierra and her friends' attempts to find out information about Will's children failed, he spent a good amount of his earnings hiring the best detectives he could find to start working in his homeland, while he wrote, rehearsed, performed, and gave one interview after another. By that time, everyone in Texas, and even across the country who watched television or used social media, knew their names and stories. But their fame lasted much longer than the allotted 15 minutes. Most interviews were superficial, repeating already known facts, but some delved into the social and political realities of their hometown. The reports drew parallels with Woody and Will's songs, but they neither confirmed nor denied their connection to real events. Since these were short reports, they managed to avoid direct answers, revealing only some inside information about the songs on the next album. The surprise came when Woody and Will were invited to participate in a podcast that had an audience of more than a million subscribers across the country. Neither of them had ever heard of the Cheater's Story Continues podcast, let alone watched it, but Barry's assistant arranged for them to spend 30 minutes in the band's rehearsal house, so they agreed. As they introduced themselves to the young, energetic presenter and sat down in front of one of three cameras, it quickly became obvious to both them and the rest of the group that this was not going to be an easy interview with simple questions. Within minutes, Woody and Will realized that the podcast host was not going to ask them simple questions or accept evasive answers. This was not a standard album promotion interview, and they wouldn't be able to get away with generalities or superficial arguments. The presenter, an energetic young woman with a sharp mind, prepared documents, Will's divorce papers, a restraining order, and even the notice of dismissal he received from his former father-in-law. She started with direct questions. Did he cheat? Did he beat his wife and children? Why was he arrested? Why did the judge rule against him if he really wasn't guilty? Initially, Will wanted to avoid answering, but he soon realized that she had strong evidence and would not let him get out of this situation easily. Finally, holding back his anger, he began to speak. Hell no. I didn't cheat. Neither you nor anyone else can provide evidence of my betrayal because this never happened. The allegations that I beat my children or my wife, physically or mentally, are absurd. 
No one will tell you that they saw me hit my children or my wife or heard about it from anyone reliable, and you will not find any evidence in medical records or hospitals. Why? Because this never happened. As for the judge's decisions in favor of my ex-wife and her lover, you should ask the judge himself, who, by the way, is her lover's uncle, and the social worker who made this report is Sarah's cousin. While I'm sure it didn't influence his opinion, you might want to ask them about their relationships and their family's relationships. The presenter smiled, and without losing her composure, answered, I already asked. I did it all. Moreover, I asked 47 randomly selected citizens in your hometown about their attitudes towards you and whether they believed you beat your wife or children. 22 people refused to answer until I promised them anonymity, but after I guaranteed their anonymity, they all unanimously agreed, along with the 25 who immediately agreed to testify. I won't read out all 47 answers to you, but the short summary is not just a no, but a hell no. Moreover, most of the respondents stated that you were the children's main educator and their favorite parent, and that even her parents felt the same way. It's strange, but none of these 47 said a single kind word about your ex-wife Sarah or her lover, Donnie Smitherman. Most respondents loved your ex-father-in-law but believed he only demoted you because his daughter threatened to not let her children, his grandchildren, see him if he didn't. Also, no one spoke well of the judge, sheriff, or social worker. I tried to talk to the sheriff, the judge, and the social worker, but none of them agreed to be interviewed or even provide a written statement. So, Mr. William Andrew Callahan, I have come to the conclusion that many of the songs on your band's first album The Human Condition are autobiographical. Am I right? Will, still seething with anger, was about to shout, damn right, but Woody quickly intervened. Miss Daniels, I think we'll let your research speak for us on this matter and leave you and your viewers to draw your own conclusions. She smiled but gave him a look of annoyance when he didn't let Will answer her next question. Woody, with a polite smile, repeated several times that not all the songs on the album were written by Will and that each member of the group contributed to the study of the human condition, which their album was dedicated to. When asked about a song on the next album that dealt with the challenges of raising children by parents with different priorities, Woody just shrugged and said that they would also allow her and her audience to draw their own conclusions. She then dove into the lyrics of Scales of Justice and Leo, revealing what she had learned from interviews with hometown residents about the judge and sheriff. These comments were far from flattering and perfectly matched what was being expressed in the songs. Will didn't know whether to be happy or afraid, but it was clear that now their guarded statements and walking the fine line of truth would not be enough. If the podcast audience actually paid attention to these revelations, and they did, then it was clear the stakes were higher. In fact, the podcast subscriber base nearly doubled within a week of the interview's publication, and the oligarchs of their hometown began to feel the ground slipping out from under their feet. What do you think of our story today? I think the wife made the mistake of accusing her husband of violence when it is not really true. What's your impression? Write in the comments. See you in the next video.